You're listening to Neo Cash Radio. Where we discuss the future of money today in the studio with you. It's JJ, Darren, and Randy. The CIA is out of control. The IBM hires quantum coders. Dash remains strong after a big week. All this and more in episode 197 here on Wednesday, March 8th, 2017. Darren? Yes, in the uh, tradition markets today, we have uh, gold down uh, to $1,161. Uh, uh, excuse me, $1,209. Silver's down to $17.21. Oil is down to $50.19. The Dow is down to 20,855 points. And the 30 year Treasury yield is up to uh, 1.3.151. So when the yield goes up, that means the value of the treasury goes down. So everything's down. Everything went down this week. Yeah, so all the money's coming out of everything right now. Uh, Randy? And then crypto markets, we've got Bitcoin uh, down to $1,161. Ethereum is up at 1701 though it was cruising a little higher this week, around 20 Uh Dash is down to forty two fifty. Zcash is down to thirty five twenty six, and Monero is up to twelve sixty seven. Just a reminder that you can tune into Neo Cash Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss a single awesome Neo Cash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, LBRY, and more. That's right. Uh, so All the places. Lots, lots of stuff happened this week, and of course. We're just going to start out with one of the big, big stories in the WikiLeaks Vault 7 release exposes the CIA arsenal. Now, Year Zero is the first publication in a series called Vault 7. The release details the tools and tactics used by the Central Intelligence Agency to hack everything from your smart TV to your car with dates ranging from 2013 to 2016. Over 8,000 documents were released, attachments, websites, all kinds of stuff. I really encourage you to check out the link we supplied on our blog, to, or you can just go to WikiLeaks. It doesn't matter. You don't have to click through our blog to, to see it. But uh, a lot of stuff here, Darren. I mean, what, do you, what, what are some of your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, people have started to go through it, and I, I don't think all the, uh, all the severity and all the uh, gravity of what is in these documents has been understood by, by people yet or even reported on by people yet. So, but uh, what has been reported is very disturbing. There's there's a report that all Samsung TVs can be used as a microphone. And, yes, a and, bug. And monitored even when they're off. Yeah, they have the, a fake off mode. Yeah, fake off mode. And uh, and uh, there's something that uh, our listeners might be interested in, Signal and other, uh, like, other encryption uh, communication apps. Uh, there, there are some phones that uh, will be able to broadcast what you t- type in to the CIA before it gets encrypted. Uh, so, so if you're using those uh, those technologies, well, think, think it about be, it. well. It should be no surprise that the CIA has targeted every device, mm-hmm. all operating systems, Android, mm-hmm. iPhone. It doesn't matter what you're using. Linux, even yeah, people there's a who lot thought of- Linux was. Was in, in, you know impervious? Is no, no. Linux is just as compromised as everything else. I never thought it was impervious, but yes, there was a lot of talk about Linux in the in the little bit, uh, you know, eight thousand pages. I didn't have time to read it. Uh, that that I was able to look at. Um, now, so 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 everything. I mean, well, I want to bring attention yeah, to the fact no, that like. Because uh, I read a couple articles and heard from a couple people that that these encrypted programs were were broken, as though the cryptography had been hacked, as though these al- as though the the hashing algorithms and the things that actually encrypted your text had somehow been cracked. And that, as far as we know, as far as I know from my reading, is not true. Yeah. And that would that would take a massive amount of computing power that I think the world would be really impressed to learn about if that was uh, possible. But yeah, it looks like what they're able to do. Um, what these documents are alleging that they're able to do, and I, I believe to be true, is that they're able to somehow bypass that and and just uh, gather what text you're writing. So you know, as I'm swiping my word, Google, you know, my Android device is guessing what words I'm typing. So somewhere in that process, or something like that, is how what you're writing, typing is being captured anywhere before it's being encrypted. Uh, we talked a little bit last week about the the I think it was last week the SHA one uh, algorithm right. finally being uh, cracked, shattered, uh, shattered. Yes, that's right. Shattered. Um, but we this this is separate. This is not yes. that. This is just uh, 
them finding other ways to get around it. And uh, I made the joke earlier this week with a friend. I think uh, the old school envelopes, like sending an actual letter through the mail, those security envelopes with the blue or gray that kind of obscures the text inside your letter. We might be getting back to a stage where that might be some of the more secure long distance communications. Yes. Who uh, knows? So there's there's everything from zero day exploits or exploits that haven't been made known to the public or right. the, the manufacturer to to malware, to viruses, to entire systems yes. for compromising, taking over, embedding malware. I mean, it's so sophisticated and it's so thorough and prevalent. Yes, uh, yeah. So that that is a, a major concern. There, there. What's coming out in these documents is that if they find an exploit or a way that uh, software can be uh, worked around, ex- exploited, uh, d- just uh, taken advantage of, then. The CIA does not report that to the uh, person providing the software in order to fix it and get a nice, secure infrastructure for the country. They actually just leave the exploit there and put it in the, their library. So in the future, they might need to use it or want to use it. So, yeah. So. And, and not only that, but uh, so uh, some of the early data coming out, I, I've read a bunch. I've read as much as, much as I can this afternoon while prepping for the show. But uh, a lot of targeting has been focused on Windows users. So there's a lot of, of malicious attacks and backdoors and, and various Trojans employed against Windows users. Uh, even even uh, air gap machines are susceptible to certain attacks with some of the tools they're using. It's, it's some very sophisticated stuff. Now, uh, one point to understand is that these tools have been out and... Um, Rob, we had, a, I guess, I don't know how long ago, but there was a story about some hacker wanting to sell off the, the CIA's tools to whomever paid a certain price, and now they didn't get that amount, like the, the auction didn't go through. Uh, but it's reasonable to assume that these tools are still out there in, in to some capacity with the contractors that worked with the CIA, uh, and, and, well, the CIA themselves. But not only that, some of the tools they, they mention in this document are tools from other countries. Like they've taken Russian right. malware and they've taken malware from other uh, state agencies mm-hmm. and they've turned it into their own, uh, you know, usage and, and whatnot. And as such, they're allowed to, or they're able to uh, to carry out attacks where uh, they're leaving Russian foot, front, foot fingerprints all That's over. That's right. It. So uh, they're, they're able to misdirect where they are. So that leads... So uh, some... say if they were making... A, if accusations were made that Russia was tampering with U.S. elections and the CIA were somehow able to... Yep. Wow. Well, and the hmm. CIA is making those allegations. Wow. That's so <laughs> weird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but one one of the biggest takeaways... Now, I I read a, went through and skimmed a lot of news stories. And the coverage on this is... By, by most of the mainstream, it's really not getting the coverage it deserves. Oh, no. Not at all. Um, but one of the things that keeps coming up as a concern is the fact that the CAA is pretty much duplicating the NSA's efforts. So a lot of what the NSA is doing with its bulk data collection, the CAA has, instead of working with the NSA, asking them for help and, and uh, doing, you know, something that, you know, an internal organization would do with another internal organization, they're, they're actually competing. And, and rather than creating a system of, of transparency where they have to go through channels to get information, they're just going completely black ops, and we're going to just do it ourselves our, and, and create our own data gathering uh, surveillance system, even though the NSA has already got that covered. Well, when, when the CIA was created, it was created at the same time the FBI was. And the, the, the idea behind creating two agencies is so that they would compete and they would try to outdo one another. Sure, but they don't hold each other accountable. So that's the place well, where the problem lies. Well, nobody's been holding them accountable. That's true. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, there's so much here to read. Uh, I, again, I, I, I beseech you to go and read it yourself. And here we're looking at an instance. It, I believe this is a, so far an anonymous source that, that WikiLeaks is dealing with. Yep. And now certainly with uh, plenty of allegations and the, the phrase f- fake news being thrown around plenty, um, there's been... I heard somewhere that Trump was trying to get uh, reporters no, no longer able to use anonymous sources. And this is the exact kind of information, of course, you want to make sure that it's uh, verified as much as possible by people who would know if these things are um, you know, it, genuine or not. But this is an instance where you, you can take a look at what's happened with Edward Snowden and sim- similar with other whistleblowers, the way they're uh, treated once these things are brought to light and why something like this someone who feared for their life or anything like that would want to stay anonymous. So it's important to keep 
uh, anonymous sources and things like that. But also, you want to be able to verify, of course, whether or not their their claims are genuine. Well, so. there's an awful lot of uh, information that it would take an extreme amount of time to uh, counterfeit. Yeah, I agree. So, so just the 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 sheer amount of information uh, suggests, and this is that only the first genuine. release too. Yeah, and I mean, there's a lot more coming. Uh, uh, if you go through it, some some names have been redacted and other things. But if you look at this trend, uh, Randy and JJ, uh, there, there, there's a trend. When uh, Edward Snowden came forward, he went to the press and he said, hey, press, you decide what should be put and should not. And I imagine that the press would be a bit more discerning than uh, WikiLeaks. So WikiLeaks chose to uh, keep all the names private. But uh, I, I, I think if this trend continues, we're going to see... You know, we're going to see uh, information released without any uh, reservations for for redacting anything. So, um, but anyway, right now we have the information at WikiLeaks. If it yeah. can be destroyed by the truth, it should be. And one, and in that vein too, uh, one thing, one final note that I'm watching for is how some of these companies respond to some of these allegations and the data from these documents. And so far, only Apple has been very vocal about responding to what's what's been uh, uh, alleged their, their devices are vulnerable to. And in fact, they said that a lot of the, the, uh, this last patch or whatever fixed a lot of the vulnerabilities that are now being talked about in these documents. Uh, but there is still yet uh, to be anything heard from Microsoft or Samsung, Google, and uh, most of the other uh, companies involved. So I'm, wa- I'm waiting to see what happens there because, well, who knows if, some of these things weren't just manufactured in the first place for the CIA to use as they have asked Apple or the FBI asked Apple for a backdoor, right? Right. Yep. So anyway, I'm waiting to see how that works out because I think the public opinion on those situations will be uh, very important going it's forward. It's funny you could say, sell the same backdoor to then I say the FBI and the CIA. Yeah, make four times the money. Yeah. And then whoever else. But anyway, moving on, IBM. Starts coding for quantum p- computers. IBM has set up a new division called IBM Q that is directed to create and sell quantum computers commercially. While the machines are still years away, IBM is confident enough to start writing software. Darren, yep, it's happening. Well, yeah, well, uh, even in uh, like 2007 or something, I know somebody got hired to uh, write quantum algorithms. They're algorithms that you could use on a quantum computer, and that all they're going to do is patent them. I, I thought this company might be in poor taste. She's writing a bunch of patents on things that don't exist yet. But, um, but uh, yeah. So, but <laughs> this, but now, now it's becoming a bit real. And and uh, reports that I have is that there, there's a, they're expecting a fifty some qubit computer to come out, maybe fifty two bit computer to come out, um, in next year or something like that. So wow. So that's uh. That, uh, the exciting times. It'll be Indeed. interesting. So uh, 58 shouldn't be enough to break every c- encryption algorithm out there, but uh, it, it, it it's we might have to rethink encryption algorithms. If, yeah, I think you're going to need quantum encryption. Well, yeah, but <laughs> but there is a there are ways to do quantum proof encryption without having a quantum computer. So there. Well, but, it, it's definitely something to track. I know we talked about the uh, DNA computing story last week. And how it would be even faster than quantum computing, but I think it's probably even further away. Uh, moving on, Nasdaq compares Bitcoin to gold. Uh, so there's an article, and you can check it out on our blog. The article starts out by pointing out the SEC is expected to issue a decision on the Bitcoin ETF next week. Uh, that's the uh, Winklevoss uh, ETF that yeah. I was yeah. hoping for. Anyway, goes on to compare Bitcoin to government-issued currencies and even to gold and explains that the rise in Bitcoin price might be due to the fact that there's no inflation. <laughs> wow. Wow. Thanks, Nasdaq. Thanks, wow. Thanks, Nasdaq. Yeah. So uh, the, the ETF, do you guys ha- hear any news about that? No, it's been dragging on since, I think, 2013, maybe 2014, but uh, the SEC is supposed to give a ruling by Saturday, which I assume means Friday, but... Um, We'll we'll find out, but um, you know, I, there's there's some there's been some speculation that the recent uh, price rise has been partly due to the speculation on this, um, but it's not clear, especially since you know, the price has been going down quite a bit today. So, it, well, there's been there's, there's, been, there's news there too. I know. Yeah, there, <laughs> there was an article that came out that said the SEC shouldn't approve the the thing the the ETF, 
Um, there's there's uh, some sentiment that the, the fact that they haven't approved it yet, uh, every day that goes by, the probability of them appro- approving it becomes less. So so well, uh, you know. I don't think the value of Bitcoin totally hinges on this ETF. No, oh, and no. they're not the only. Certainly, they're not the only ones. There's a couple others that have applied uh, to do the same. I'm guessing the SEC's ruling on one would apply to the others as well. Um, but yeah, there's certainly tons more factors that goes in t- that go into uh, the value of any any coin, any currency. But, sure. Yeah. So this is related to some other things that happened this week. Uh, there's uh, there's been uh, like Fiverr has. Uh, Stopped accepting Bitcoin, uh, and and it's because of the way the the network's working. Yeah, uh, the fees have gone up to be a tremendous amount. And Fiverr's a great graphic yeah. design uh, website that people can get like logos and stuff designed for five bucks. But they were complaining yeah. that the uh, transaction fees are making it not uh, not not reasonable. Yeah, I mean, not reasonable. A for two dollar to- transaction fee for a five dollar gig. That's not worth it. No, uh, not at all. Yeah, and so uh, yeah, so the fees have gone up tremendously. So uh, d- d- just to hear this news about the ETF and all that stuff just makes it kind of sad because it's kind of on at towards the end of or the a working system or or if Bitcoin can somehow recover from this, it's it's still gonna it's it's still gonna be harmed by having this period where it's kind of in limbo and and can't really be used for everyday things. Yeah. Well, and and maybe maybe this this next story, yeah. Th- People's Bank of China explores strict regulation of Bitcoin exchanges. So Zhao Zudong, I, I, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but is the director of the People's Bank of China's Business Administration Unit, and he suggests that the PBOC undertake a an observation period for the Bitcoin exchanges. But at the same time, he's also talking about establishing a bottom line for exchanges to follow or be blacklisted. So there's no there's no two two ways about this. The People's Bank of China is going to be regulating exchanges and setting a certain uh, policy that they must adhere to or suffer. So this is that, you know, the, you, you couple the ETF reaching, you know, like sort of happening a little bit too late, it seems, given the current climate. But now Bitcoin is in no way dead. It's just becoming unusable. Yeah, the, yeah, there's that. I mean, the, the people will still, there is definitely a lot of people who have value in Bitcoin and they're going to try to use it and they're going to try to get as much value out of it as possible. But it, it, let's let's talk about some of these other stories here. We mentioned Fiverr drops Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, BitPay. What happened? BitPay. Yeah, BitPay raised uh, their minimum uh, p- payment. So if you're making a purchase, uh, you used to be able to make a four cent purchase or more with BitPay and now it's uh, up to a dollar. So and, uh, it's going to be a dollar or more. And what about this Reddit discussion? Yeah, that you want to mention? So yeah, on Reddit, there's a, a post, and actually, Randy, you brought this up, and I didn't believe it when I read it. I, I did see it a little bit before the show, uh, but the claim is that fifty five point two percent of Bitcoin addresses, uh, for, for those addresses, uh, fees are now bigger than the amount of Bitcoin they have. Okay, so now, I have one question to ask before we get any uh-huh. further. In the past with Bitcoin, if you had a certain number of coin days or amount of days that the coins were in that address, right. that you would qualify for no fee. That's right. correct. Is that still in a place? Um, I would say effectively not. So, in Like miners, just if they see no fee, they're just not respecting yeah, the coin days at all. In, in the old days, uh, if they went with their stock implementation of the protocol of the, of the software, uh, there would only be 50 k 50,000 bytes set aside for free transactions okay and uh, so now with the network you know over a megabyte of transactions coming through every 10 minutes um you know the the chances that your free transaction could get in that 50 kilobytes would be quite small and now uh i believe a, a lot of miners have basically done their own custom thing where they just b- rank the uh they do what's economically reason or what economically in their interest they rank all the 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 transactions by fee per byte and accept the highest so Makes I, sense. I, I so not every miner will approve uh free transactions and the ones that do most likely only have 50 uh 50 kilobytes set aside for those free transactions yeah i, mean, I you know i've set a couple little bitcoin addresses up here and there 
um, some for our website and our YouTube accounts just to and to test them to make sure that they actually get through. You know, I've pushed a couple cents or a dollar through something like that just to make sure that I copied and pasted the code right. And so <clears throat> I have a few of those little accounts open with just a few cents in them and it's that money is as good as gone now i mean trying to trying to move just a few cents the fee is is higher um than actually trying to to get it out so if you've got a good amount of like low uh, account wallets you know consolidating them into one account so you'll have less inputs or sorry yeah less inputs when you're making a a transaction uh that might serve you sooner than later if this doesn't clear up but that advice, if that advice is just getting to you, it might be a little late. For <laughs> that's that. that's true. Uh, but well, so so what do you what do you make of fifth of uh, over half the Bitcoin wallet uh, that are known on the blockchain, or half of the UTXO? I imagine if yes. they just base it off of that. Mm-hmm. Over half the UTXO has not enough funds to move them out of the wallet. Right. So I mean, that's no. On one hand, it's like how many of these are are wallets people don't care about anymore, or like you know. Here's the thing. Okay, here's the it's thing. Hard to Imagine say. a lot of these wallets were started up. I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit here. They were started up when Bitcoin was worth two hundred to three hundred, four hundred dollars, right? Okay. And there was only a few cents in there, right? Or you know, there's fifteen cents left, and I can't spend fifteen cents. Well, now that Bitcoin is twelve hundred dollars, there it's worth three or four or five times as much. Now it's a dollar's worth of Bitcoin, right? Right. But. I mean, they still can't pay for the fee, so what's the point? I mean, they they left the 15 cents in there because they couldn't spend it earlier. Well, you still can't spend it. Right. So. There you go. I mean, but the thing is, is the actual usability uh, of Bitcoin is is important to note because that's really where the value partially comes in. Sure, the the lack of government oversight and, and all that sort of stuff uh, is important, too, but. Yeah, if you can't I'm, use it, what's what's? I mean, yeah, I, I I'm a big believer in this. The utility is what you should look for. If it's not something that you can use, if it doesn't provide you value, then uh, then I'm not very uh, hopeful about your project. So I'm looking at the mempool right now uh, on blockchain.info, and it's right about right about, it's still around six uh, sixty million uh, bytes. So. Uh, yeah, that's and, and trade block, uh, which I think is a little bit dis- more discerning on its transactions, says it's twenty six megabytes. Okay, so it's between twenty six and sixty, somewhere around there. Yeah. Okay, every node can have a different uh, amount now, of transaction. We, we we we've been tracking this for a few weeks now, and it's you know every time we measure it, it's around sixty for whatever reason on on this this method. So okay, um, let's just say for for argument's sake that it, it's it's still thirty five average. Let's just say yeah, yeah. 35 uh, blocks um, worth of, of Bitcoin transactions mm-hmm. waiting to be put into block the blockchain. Yeah. So this this is saying there's 16 Bitcoins worth of fees waiting to be put in the blockchain right now. Now, in the past, when we've seen mempool spikes, uh, they've only lasted a for a sh- short while usually, and then they go away, and it, and it bounces around the, uh, the 1 to 5 megabyte range is usually where it would bounce right. around in, in historically. Now, I, this is... At least the more recent history, um, this this last spike has been lasting for a while. This it's not it's not a spike anymore. Now it's a glut of unconfirmed transactions or un- right. unblocked transactions. Um, this, I mean, this is more information that's just backing up the fact that there is no cure in sight. And now, yeah, and if there is a cure, it's three weeks out. <laughs> well, okay, but even then, so, it's horrible. So uh, we have news from Atpool. We we along do that line. Yes. Right? Ant Antpool, I guess, started signaling that uh, they're they're mining some Bitcoin unlimited uh, blocks. I don't know the exact numbers of the past few days, um, but that's is it the largest mining? Pool yeah, it is. It in is China. Yeah, current. No, it's the currently largest in the world. Uh, okay, that's so not uh, a small thing. Yeah, it's. I think it's got about twelve or thirteen percent of the hash power of the whole network. Uh, yeah, so the, being such a large operation, they have many different nodes, and I, I think the miners can connect to different nodes. And so uh, it seems like the ones in Beijing slowly are getting converted over to Bitcoin Unlimited. And uh, one would expect that the U.S. and other nodes would follow as well. And Bitcoin Unlimited, Bitcoin Unlimited, of course, uh, we did a special interview with Roger Veer a few months ago talking about Bitcoin Unlimited and how uh, that allows miners to set how large they would like their block size uh, limit to be. Uh, a couple of tweets actually this last week from Roger Veer that I was going to bring up. <clears throat> Um, he was pointing out, we actually retweeted them from at Neocash Radio, um, 
one from a few days ago, basically saying you can now use Visa to pay for Bitcoin transactions to go faster. Uh, the BTC.com has a transaction accelerator that says, excuse me, that says, quote, cooperating with main Bitcoin pools, we provide transaction accelerator service, which can make the probability of confirming transactions with one hour come up to 75% and or 98% within four hours. Um, and so he was... Uh, <laughs> In that's bi- <laughs> that's that's the market going forward with Bitcoin. Is <laughs> Six dollars and eighty-eight cents per kilobyte that wow. you could pay yeah. uh, by credit card. Yeah, that, that, secure payments wow. by Stripe. I mean that that defeats the whole purpose of Bitcoin if you had to pull out your credit card to get your transaction yeah. to go through. Absolutely. And the other was uh, on March second. He said, "I did my first Dash payment yesterday. I moved a hundred thousand dollars for about point three cents, and it was confirmed in the next block. Bitcoin used to work that well. Yeah. Yeah." So, well, That's... looking at node counter right now, I've see, I'm seeing uh, Bitcoin unlimited blocks and the last thousand twenty four point six percent, then Segwit blocks twenty five point six percent. So, uh, you know, it's Bitcoin unlimited definitely needs to get uh, a lot more before they fork. Oh yeah. But on the discussion of forks, Darren, you had a blog post this week oh, that yeah. talked about just that subject. Yeah. So. Uh... In past shows, I've uh, talked about how I think uh, people are uh, throwing a word uh, fork around and either not knowing what it means or purposely uh, changing its meaning. And so I put up a post about what I believe a hard fork, hard fork should be and, and uh, how to define it. And at the, at the end of the post, I actually think there should be a different word for a fork, but there's... Uh, but there, but one thing I r- realized when writing it up, there's actually lots of different types of forks. If you have a programming project, you can it can go in different directions. That's a fork. If you have uh, a blockchain, you can split into two, and that's a fork. Uh, you, and uh, also a protocol, which is where the distinction between hard and soft makes sense. Uh, can fork so so I well, think that the fact that fork is used for so many different things makes it a confusing word. I and I think that's that's a good point to to be made because it is almost being attached with emotionally charged energy now. When you say oh, the word yeah. fork in the Bitcoin debate, some people will be triggered by that and and have an emotional almost emotional response, almost yeah, irrational. Yeah. I mean, I I see it, but I try to stay away from them, right. all these emotional arguments. But uh, like I think your your way of saying that, well, a fork uh, results in two different paths right. instead of right. Uh, Bitcoin's for, a previous forks that we talked about. They they weren't exactly forks. They were let's say a bend in the road. Yeah, but yeah. But so you went around a curve. The protocol of, changed, and it did change. The, but everybody went with it. Which, yeah, the, which resulted in only one protocol. Yes, correct. The, I mean, but and that could happen this time. But there's a lot of dissension, so there's a chance that it might there might not just be one protocol in the uh, at the end of all this. But well, last year after the Dow, you know, failed miserably, and Ethereum had its fork and Ethereum Classic was born, um, everyone who had a certain amount of one coin of Ethereum actually had the same amount of both coins after the fork. So it left you know anyone who had pre-existing coins with a matching amount of both coins. And so in a way, it kept me interested. Um, I eventually got rid of my Ethereum Classic, but it was... You know, if a fork were ever to happen to Bitcoin, where it resulted in two divergent um, chains... Anyone who's got one is going to have the exact same amount of both starting out until they start transacting, of course. But um, in in a that way, that doesn't mean you're going to have the same amount of value total. Correct. But it's a little bit more of a problem if it actually forks because you have you have companies like BitPay that you know they're providing a service, and there's all kinds of use cases that you can imagine in the future that um, we're going down. So if, if there's Bitcoin A and there's Bitcoin B. Uh, you know, even if uh, BitPay says we're going with the biggest, then that's A, and uh, and so send us Bitcoin A. Well, they could have users send Bitcoin A, but accidentally send both. They could have users mm-hmm. send uh, send Bitcoin B and expect to be paid as if it's Bitcoin A. Uh, you know, so there's just going to be a, you know, I I think it's just a customer service nightmare for the for the actual businesses that are using Bitcoin. When when the Ethereum forked. It's still a lot of you know very diehard you know I I, I hate it's to still use very the word, young but yeah di- diehard a lot of like nerdy people First behind movers, it so so early like, adopters uh, yeah. some people didn't understand what would happen with this fork but a lot of people did and and uh, people knew how to deal with it and 
and things like that. So, so I, I'm just thinking as the infrastructure grows around a cryptocurrency type project, the, a fork's going to be a bigger and bigger deal, right? Yes. So, so it, it just it's just something to think about going forward. If you want a uh, like a like a sustaining project that goes on indefinitely. Uh, you've got to be able to handle these fork situations uh, with with some type of uh, grace. schedule and grace. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I was watching some of the Dash detailed videos uh, earlier today. Yeah, speaking and, of forks. Yeah, well, and I, I've read a little bit of, or watched a little bit of their videos on sporks, and uh, you seemed relatively f- familiar. I don't know if you're yeah, able was, to talk about I, them a little more. I was actually looking into them today, uh, or not, well, yesterday or a few days ago. And uh, what is a spork and what would make it different from a yeah, hard fork or soft fork? So a, a spork is, uh, it's, it's a fork. It's a, it's a fork in a protocol, the dash protocol in this case. And, uh, there are certain variables that the network can turn on and off. And when I say that, I'll have to clarify what I mean by network in a second, but, um, it, it can turn on and off. So the idea is that when you're going from a transition to one thing to another, you can turn off something so that you uh, allow the network a little bit more freedom and everything meshes well, and then turn it on. Turn okay. On, uh, so, so you can turn on aspects of this protocol. And um, and one thing uh, that it one thing that I was interested in, uh, I said the network turns it on. Well, I, I, I looked into that, and the answer I got, I, I haven't had time to read all the documentation, but the answer I got was that, the uh, developers have a key, basically, you know, private key. That, and multi-sig. Yes, and that they're using to turn on and off these variables, which clearly from a decent, somebody that appreciates decentralization, that's that's uh, a problem, right? Because what if the one guy or a few guys with the keys do the wrong thing, right? Or just go the wrong way, like the Bitcoin development team may have. Or, sure. Or, um, so... Uh, so, so you just need to be able to set up to sell, solve that problem in the future, and there is a uh, a, a process to do that. And they're they're already implementing that in uh, twenty and twelve point two. It was supposed to come out now, but it hasn't. And and um, but this will get that in control of yeah, the network versus it'll, it'll the developers. It'll put it in developers. control of the uh, network nodes. Got it. Uh, the master nodes. And I personally have a plea to the developers of Dash. Please have the master nodes vote on the key. Have the master nodes vote on the key. Like, say you're the development team. Say, hey, we want the master nodes to vote for this key, and your competing development team wants the master nodes to vote for the other key. So that way, the master, the the developer team that gets the votes can turn it on and off, and that's going to allow for that smooth spork property. If you're having the master nodes change, if they actually have to log on to their master node, get on their server, you know, uh, do something. Now you can do it from your remote client. I understand, but um, and and you have to type it in. I think that they're just like with a lot of the miners not s- signaling what type of block they want. I think you're going to have some lag in in which uh, development team you want to have that key. And so I, I really think it should be kind of an executive model, and the master node should just vote for the executive. So I, that, I am strongly in favor of that. Now, model. are you thinking executive per uh, project or per item uh, per, or per, per time? Per time. So like if a, the like master nodes change their vote, then the uh, then the uh, keys that need to be used to turn on and off the spork uh, would have to come from these other keys. Okay. Right. So that that way it can just be all smooth, all uh, all everything together, like like what's happening now. What's happening now with the sporks and a well-behaved development team, it's working fine. Mm-hmm. And I think you just need to be able to veto the development team. No, you're doing the wrong thing. We want this other development team to do it. Got right? it. So whoever can get the most uh, rallying above around their key uh, can do it. And since you've already got all the cryptography built into it, you, they just have to point, they just have to vote for an address. You can encode all those keys in one address. So you just you just vote for an address and then and then they sign the thing relative to that address and you're good. Excellent. Well, we have more Dash news we want to get to right now. Yeah, just real quickly from uh, today's Dash Detailed, I saw that the Masternode network has been uh, under a DDoS attack for the past couple days. Uh, the attacker has, quote, caused higher CPU and bandwidth usage for most of the Masternodes. And uh, 
it, I guess it apparently turned off about a, it made about a hundred master nodes go down. Um, they they speculate that those were hosted on low end VPS services that were about a dollar a month. So uh, they say it's not surprising to see some of them down. They're encouraging master node owners uh, to move to quote better hardware or upgrading a, an upgraded hosting plan to ensure that your master node doesn't fall out of payment queue during such events. Yeah. So, so the and and the the headline was that uh, the Dash network is or the Dash master node network is now worth. Uh, attacking and and DDoS uh, attacks do cost money, so someone is investing some kind of funds. Uh, in, Shake, in shaked off the weak the weak links, really. <laughs> honestly, that's that's how a lot of these yeah. things hash out. And, and yeah, it has been presented as a good thing. The fact that somebody's attacking it means that Dash is as Im- so important enough important enough to attack, and uh, it's certainly surviving this attack right now. So, uh, chi- ch- the, more news. We've had so much news in the crypto and technology realm that we, we haven't had too much time with economics. But, uh, well, one thing you might want to keep up with is China sees its first trade deficit in three years. So, reported by the BBC, uh, the, uh, chi- uh, the, B- the Chinese exports unexpectedly fell 1.3%, giving a trade deficit of $9.2 billion for the for the month. So, wow. First so, time in three years, huh? Yeah, so so this is interesting. It, it's something to keep an eye on and see if this is a trend that continues. Because well, if they continue to cut back on their smokestack, quote unquote, smokestack jobs to cut down on the air pollution and whatnot, yeah, uh, that's I imagine they're going to trade less uh, iron and, and materials like that. So that sounds maybe maybe. Now, Randy, you've got a quick mention you want to add before the end of the show. I watched some of the most amazing uh, art I've ever consumed. It was a show, I'm about a year, a little over a year late to watch it, but Horace and Pete, uh, Louis C.K. wrote and directed and starred in uh, what he's calling a dramatic tragedy. Um, I'm not a hugely emotional person, but this show got me to cry in like eight out of ten episodes, and it's really well written. uh, The dialogue, the acting, the the setting, it's kind of shot like a play. Um, Really, really, really moving, and uh, Louis C.K. self-financed it. He released it on his website, uh, in January 2016, I'd heard about it, but I hadn't watched it. Hulu recently picked it up, and so does he I watched take Bitcoin? it on there. He does. You can pay with Bitcoin right on his website. So I wanted to get a little mention for that. But as, it's as, called Horace and Pete. It's a, it was an amazing show. Until the fees are more than your balance. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, not family friendly, but really encourage you to watch it. Just a reminder that you can tune in to Neocash Radio every Wednesday. Don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Go to our website. Seriously. Go to neocashradio.com. And retweet all the things. And retweet all the things. For the Neocash Radio crew, this is JJ. Darren. And Randy. Neocash Radio. Where we discuss the future of money today. Today.